This series was funded by great viewers just like you over on Patreon. Check out the description or end of the video to hear how you can take part in making the show even more amazing. Hey everyone, Kaijin Goomba here and welcome to another episode of Witch Ninja, a series that looks at media's most popular shinobi to see which are good and which are bad. And today we're looking at the franchise that made the term ninja into a household name, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So, funny thing about this franchise in February of 2018, two big pieces of Ninja Turtle related news dropped. On February 1st, the newest iteration of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles called Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was announced on Nickelodeon and people were not happy. Just what the heck happened? They looked like a cross between Michael Bay's Turtles and Sonic Boom. And the more people looked, the more upset they got. Leo working with a Nodachi instead of his katanas? And what's Michelangelo got over there? Some kind of bladed yo-yo? Where's his nunchucks? Black April's fine, but why is she hoverboarding on Donatello? And Raph, good lord man, what happened? Tonfus instead of Sai? He's enormous, and apparently he's the leader now? Whoa, whoa, hold up. You don't give orders to my team, okay? I'm the order guy. This guy! Suffice to say, there's some concern in the community. But just as hope seemed lost for TMNT fans, a week later, NetherRealm Studios released DLC we never saw coming. The Turtles, just like we remember them. You'll be rage quitting in a heartbeat. Unlike coding, this'll be easy. My training will see me through. I run a delivery service for pain. Fully imagined in 3D yet so familiar you'd swear you were in the 90s. In fact, the trailer itself made a ton of references to the turtle's lineage. Big Apple, 3 a.m. Pepperoni. Yeah, February's been quite a month for the Turtles. And because of this, everyone over on Patreon has been really curious about our thoughts on whether or not the heroes on the half shell are worth their salt as ninja. Well, we made some pretty interesting discoveries in our research. Allow us to go off on a tangent for just a minute because in our search, we found some interesting info you might like to see. The most of which being the rise of the TMNT might not be so far gone canonically as we think. Sure, this is the first time each of the turtles is a different species, Raph being a snapper, Leo being a painted turtle, Donnie possibly being a softshell turtle, thus the backpack, and Mikey? Uh, still not sure on that one. But the choice of weapons, which is definitely a point of contention for a lot of folks, isn't as surprising as you may think. Everyone lost their minds when they saw Raph with Tonfas instead of Sai. But let's have a look at the cover of issue 9 from the original TMNT Mirage comics. What's that over there? A Tonfa? Curious? After opening the actual comic, oh look, Raph is training with a Tonfa. And yes, he's even using them during the mission that the Turtles are on in this issue. How interesting. And what about Michelangelo and his death yo-yo in Rise? This is actually a Mandiki Gusari, a ninja weapon that we've discussed before in detail in another Witch Ninja video about arms. Not only is it a legit ninja weapon, Mikey's used this thing before. Not only in the original issue 9, same as Raph and his Tonfas, but also in the 1987 cartoon that everyone seems to judge every other iteration of the Turtles on. You're no match for Michelangelo, master of the Manrique Gusari! And this brings us to our findings about whether or not the TMNT make for good historical ninja. In every other iteration of the Turtles from the original comics to the 2012 iteration, there have been phenomenal real-life ninja references in each universe of the franchise. Except for the 1987 cartoon. Seriously, I hate to say it guys, but I think as far as legitimate ninjutsu is concerned, even the Michael Bay produced Ninja Turtles are better ninjas than the 87 iterations. What part of moving the shadows don't you understand? Put down your torches and pitchforks, Internet. I said better ninjas, not better show. Yeah, I was born in the mid-80s and grew up with the Ninja Turtles in their heyday. However, I gotta question how legit these boys really are as ninja. But regardless of which side of the fence you're on, let's have a brief look at each of the more well-known generations of turtles to show you just how ninja they really are compared to the benchmark. Starting with the source dimension itself, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird's 1984 original, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Unlike the Turtles of today, the original team and T were identical in appearance, having the same build and same outfit. Even when the series transitioned from black and white ink to colored, each of the Turtles had the same skin tone, outfits, and headbands, making them fairly indistinguishable from each other save for what weapon they had. 
And this didn't sit well with marketing. I think he realized even in the graphic novels where they all had red bandanas, that there had to be more differentiation of the turtles. You just looked at the comic, at, at the dry drawings of the turtles, you couldn't tell one from the other except for the weapon. You couldn't say one's the leader, right? Ah, but Kevin, James, whether it was an accident or not, that's a concept of true ninjutsu. The Bushin no Jutsu to be precise. If you're a longtime watcher of Witch Ninja, you might already be catching on. But for you fresh faces, the Bushin no Jutsu was a visual distraction technique of true life ninja, wherein, through different methods, ninjas would create body doubles of themselves to confuse enemies, which led to some really interesting head games as well as brilliant escape tactics. The most likely way of doing such would be for ninjas to dress in identical outfits while infiltrating a target location. Eyewitness information would be confused, inexperienced soldiers would become overwhelmed, and there would be little chance that the enemy would be able to discern just how many different shinobi were sneaking around. In the case of the turtles, by looking identical, any potential eyewitness or enemy would be hard-pressed to determine which turtle is which, or even how many of them there are in total. As we've seen in future installments, by becoming easier to identify, more intelligent villains could exploit their various weaknesses, like Raphael's impulsiveness. I volunteer to go kick his butt right after I kick yours! <laughs> also, by training the turtles in various weapons as we've also seen in issue 9 of the Mirage comics, Shredder, the Foot, no one would be able to truly identify the turtles' individuality if they were so flexible with their weapons as Splinter was attempting to train them to be. As each turtle could use weapons both blunt and bladed, held or thrown, their abilities in combat would also be mirrored by their ability to hide their identity when it came for them to come out for combat. Whereas in the 1987 cartoon, even the most bumbling of Shredder's minions could identify each individual turtle and potentially exploit not only their weakness and fighting style, but also their psyche. Next we have one of my personal favorites, the 1990 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. Despite the goofy nature of the film thanks to its association with the 1987 cartoon, the movie hits a ton of parallels with the comic, such as the foot attacking the turtles in April's apartment above her antique store, Casey coming to the rescue, the final showdown on the roof, Honestly, it's the most faithful representation of the true story I've seen outside the comic itself. And within it are glimmers of true ninjutsu concepts, the best of which happen within the first couple of scenes in the movie. When the turtles rescue April, they knock out the light source, move quickly, hit hard, and stay silent. Whoa! Except Michelangelo, because, well, he's Michelangelo. <laughs> then quickly escaping before anyone can see them. This is a combination of a few shinobi iri, or methods of infiltration. Raph shattering the light source and the turtles moving fast falls under the Yogi Gakure no Jutsu and the Joy On Jutsu. The earlier being a distraction such as throwing an object to get the attention of an enemy, and the latter being a technique for erasing light and sound in order to move freely without casting a shadow or making unnecessary noise. And in the 87 Turtles cartoon, when they save April, what do they do? Come out of the shadows and expose themselves! Bingo! Now yeah, we're dealing with a real mind here. You're... you're turtles! Yep, so we are. I just... <sighs> Comparatively, what did Splinter say the first time we saw him in the Ninja Turtles movie? Our domain is the shadow. Stray from it reluctantly. For when you do, you must strike hard and fade away. Without a trace. Yeah, ever wonder why Raph was so upset during the scene? When I was a kid, I thought he was mad that he lost a hard-to-make weapon. But from an analytical perspective, Raph's hard on himself because he left a trace, a clue. He failed as a true ninja. And that's a pretty big tone shift from this. Come on, lady, wake up! <laughs> and hey, say what you want about Raph in the trench coat disguise, hiding in plain sight was more common to the ninja than sneaking around the shadows by far. Whether they dressed as shonen merchants, komoso monks, or tsune no nari or common folk. Yeah, I know, being a turtle is something that's a lot harder to cover up than just being a human ninja. But the Shinobi no Hinso Jutsu is a true-to-life ninja concept and it seems Splinter taught them well. In the movie, anyway. I still can't believe it was April that had to do something about the turtle's appearance and behavior in the 87 cartoon. Wait here! Here's looking at you, kid! Ugh. Really, guys? Ugh. Where did they come up with this stuff? And even when the turtles couldn't hide in plain sight, they executed some textbook jutsus, one of which being the Tanuki Gakure no Jutsu. This technique involves hiding in a high place that exploits the fact that people rarely look up, with the 45 degree angle typically being the blind spot. In this movie, Donatello executes this perfectly. 
Now jump ahead a decade later and we now come to the 2003 TMNT, and though things get a little more sci-fi with multiple dimensions, aliens, and the Shredder being an Utrum of all things, it still holds tight to some ninja roots, many of which come from Splinter's continuing teachings, especially this one. You have won, but do you know why? Well, I have the superior weapons. Leonardo, attack me with your katana. <laughs> In the hands of a true ninjutsu master, anything can be a deadly weapon. You may doubt an old man's ability to disarm a younger opponent's weapons with little more than a stick, but in Hatsumi Masaki's book, Way of the Ninja Secret Techniques, Masaki shows over a dozen different disarming and throwing techniques against sword wielders, including the Kaishi Dori, Ken Nagashi, and the Katate Nage. Masaki might be getting a little long in the tooth, but the creator of Bujinkan Ninjutsu is still a man not easily trifled with. Splinter also saying that anything can be a worthwhile weapon in the hands of a true shinobi also carries quite a bit of historical weight. Ninja weren't exactly rich. In fact, most individual clans were self-supportive away from Japan's proper economy. This meant that forging expensive, quote, real weapons was usually impossible for the reclusive hill-dwelling ninja clans. Thus, they forged weapons from everything between their sickles and chains creating kusarigama to carving and shaping coins and scraps of metal to form shuriken. The true weapons of the ninja were not ornate or masterfully crafted like the blades of the samurai. Instead, they were handcrafted tools made into deadly weapons in the hands of true ninja. This is why Splinter, in several universes, has been so adamant about the turtles learning to master not only each other's weapons, but weapons we haven't seen them use since the original comics. And this finally brings us to the 2012 TMNT, and oh man, Despite this Turtles universe being more cartoonish and blocky looking than the others, it holds some of the most core concepts of ninjutsu than any other version. Yeah, if I had to compare this series to the 87 cartoon, it would be exactly this. You can't do that, dudes! Why not? Because we live in secret here! We have to live in the shadows like, you know, real ninjas. It, too, also features the turtles trying to learn each other's weapons, as Splinter says it'll improve their abilities. Again, a pretty ninja principle. There's also an entire episode devoted to Donatello creating handmade smoke bombs from eggs, aka materials that they have to work with, like real ninja. I carefully drill two holes in an eggshell without cracking it, slowly blow out the contents, wait for the inside to dry, then pour in flash powder and seal both holes with wax. Now, granted, for whatever reason, these smoke bombs allowed the turtles to just randomly teleport at will. But real ninjas would create, using the same process of using hollowed out eggshells, Metsubushi bombs, which are kind of like smoke bombs, but a bit more focused. Unlike Torinoko and other loud explosive smoke bombs which distracted an area, Metsubushi or eye closer bombs distracted the enemy personally. Basically, you're putting stimulants into their faces, eyes, and ears to disorient them. A horrible concoction of pepper, ashes, dirt, and other sensitive powders would be filled into the eggshells, and then the eggshells would be wrapped in paper for stability. Should the ninja be caught, they would throw these eggs at their enemies' faces as a noxious cloud of pepper, filth, and spices would explode in their face, allowing the ninja to quickly escape or reposition themselves. Maybe that's why Michelangelo keeps appearing in different places after he throws these things. He's just constantly disorienting the others to a point where it looks like he's moving that quickly. But I'm sure a two-minute gag of Mikey tossing hazardous powder in the face of his brothers would have been a little too much for this show. Eh, maybe, but there's another aspect of 2012 TMNT that pulls right from ninja history. The concept of Mushin, or being without mind. You see? Mikey does not think. This may look like a stereotypical stab at martial arts, but the concept of anticipating attack without thought is very much a core ninjutsu principle that continues to this day in Bujinkan ninjutsu. In fact, it's the rank 5 Goldon test for upcoming masters known as the Saki test, or the test of ill intent. The test taker will sit back facing the test giver, while the test giver will strike the student with a non-lethal weapon like a shinai. The test taker is encouraged to relax and unfocus their mind from the jitters of what might come, and instead, quiet their mind and focus on the atmosphere. If it's successfully dodged, the test is passed. However, bail too soon or take a crack in the head, and it's time to try again. A lot of people denounce the concept of Mushin, saying it's all smoke and mirrors. But for everyone who's ever been able to get into the zone in any sort of activity, I think it's safe to say that acting without thinking is a very plausible thing. And now we come to the Turtles' most one-to-one -one, true-to-life ninja technique. Out of everything we've covered so far in all of the different universes spanning the entire lifetime of this franchise, this is the most truly ninja thing we've seen come out of TMNT. Green. Pure. Tall. 
Ja. Kai. Jin. Ret. Tai. Zen. While the healing hand technique and its healing powers might seem like a fantasy, the ability that Splinter uses and subsequently teaches Leonardo isn't 100% fiction. It's another technique we tend to come back to on a regular basis here on Witch Ninja. Literally, word for word, this is known as the Kuji In or Nine Cuts. Nin, Pyo, To, Sha, Kai, Jin, Netz, Zai, Zen. Nine hand gestures accompanied by chants that Ninja believed open up their ability to manipulate their body's energy. Popular media would have you believe that these hand gestures, or mudras as they're called, somehow unlock some kind of ninja magic to create gouts of flame or turn invisible. But the truth is, ninja utilize these and many other mudras in combination with meditative chants in order to overcome inhuman situations, such as extreme fear, stress, and other disorders of the body. In the case of TMNT, after being poisoned by the mutated Karai, Leo regains his composure and overcomes his poison state by chanting the Kuji-in in meditation. Though the Kuji-in couldn't immediately stave off poison as in the show, there is scientific evidence to support the theory that the Kuji-in had physical and psychological impacts on the body. At Mei University, Dr. Teruhisa Komori has been researching the effects of mudras on the human body by studying brain waves of individuals placed in stressful situations, one group having performed the hand gestures and another group that had not. Dr. Komori's results showed that ninja who utilized the hand mudras during stressful situations were actually able to stabilize their composure for short periods of time, with stress waves dramatically lowered while mental relaxation increased as shown by the red and blue bars respectively. For Leo to stop and execute the Kuji-in in order to regain composure is not so unlike what a real ninja would do given the circumstance. Under intense levels of stress such as fleeing, hiding from sentries who are a bit too close for comfort, or yes, maybe even being poisoned, ninja would perform various chants and mudras in order to stabilize themselves. And if Dr. Komori's research is legit, there might be more truth to this technique than we give it credit for. You know, for an improbable comic series about shinobi reptiles that took most of its inspiration from Daredevil and developed a cartoon series in order to sell toys, there's a surprisingly huge amount of legit ninja culture that spans the three decades of lifetime TMNT has been running, and it's not even close to being done. Will Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles be everything the fans wanted? Well, probably not. But if we're judging the series based on appearance alone, I would have thought that the 2012 version would have been terrible, but it wasn't. In fact, in terms of the Turtles and Splinter being actual ninjas, it's the most credible out of the bunch. And that's saying a lot considering how much real shinobi culture we found in the different series starting all the way back to the original comics of 1984. So, in our final verdict, are the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles actually good ninjas? Well, in most cases, absolutely. But ironically, in the version that the fans have defined as the bar, yeah, we still have our doubts. But thanks for watching everyone, a big thank you to my patrons who made this show possible, and a big thanks to everyone who came out to my research Twitch stream to help me find all this amazing information, link to that in the description as well. If you're digging learning about ninja culture through the TMNT, the turtles aren't the only source of information for real ninjutsu. Shredder himself has a ton of shinobi history behind him. Or you can check out the ninja origins of another comic book shinobi, Batman. You can find all of those by clicking the annotations and links in the description below, and don't forget to subscribe, because after crossing our second goal on Patreon, even more episodes are coming, so be sure not to miss out. But until next time everyone, this is Gaijin Goomba, signing out.